The year was 1989. A guy named Steve was kicking around Los Angeles with his band when he rented some space in a recording studio owned by another guy named Greg. Sounds like just another generic down-on-your-luck L.A. music story, right? Well, it started off that way, but things would take a very different turn. Annoyed by what they called the tyrannical oppression of American drinkers from generic, fizzy yellow beer, Steve and Greg decided to open a brewery. By 1996, Steve Wagner and Greg Cook had launched Stone Brewing in San Marcos, California. Today, of course, Stone is one of the top 10 largest craft breweries in the United States. But success, especially that type of success, never just happens overnight. Stone produced some great and even famous beer in its early years. But it was the sensation of arrogant bastard ale that vaulted Stone into the stratosphere of craft brewing royalty. The beer, of course, is delicious. But the great genius of Arrogant Bastard wasn't just its flavor, but its marketing. And using a word like bastard. As Greg Cook told an industry watchdog last year, they started off getting called bastards who were arrogant enough to think they stood a chance in the industry. So, what to do? Well, Stone adopted an age-old marketing ploy. Hang a lantern on it. Own it. Wrap yourself in that memorable insult and dare the consumer to come along. Say things like, arrogant bastards and aggressive beer. You probably won't like it. The result? Stone's pioneering marketing style worked so well that breweries across America started adopting their own edgy marketing campaigns and in-your-face branding styles. And they also started throwing in the occasional curse word, too. Today, beer names and labels are brilliantly festooned with clever names and edgy artwork, all in a bid to make the consumer remember that beer. And then go buy it. I'd like to tell you that the story ends there. A clever little tale of marketing success. But not everyone liked this aggressive and boundary-pushing beer. And the ones that didn't turned out to be pretty powerful. I'm Jared Dieterly, author of Give Me Liberty and Give Me a Drink. And this is The Right to Drink. Make me a Negroni, margarita old-fashioned. Let's pop the champagne. We've got a right to drink. Hey, everybody, and welcome to the show where we talk about drinking and everything that gets in the way. Today, we're taking a scandalous dive into beer labels and swear words. So, you know the origin story of Stone Brewing's arrogant bastard now. But another key early pioneer in the beer world shift to in-your-face marketing was Flying Dog Brewery, originally based in Colorado, but now in Maryland. You see, Flying Dog didn't want to just be any old brewery. They wanted to push the envelope and make you remember them. So they teamed up with famed artist Ralph Steadman, known for memorably illustrating many of Hunter S. Thompson's works, to design some truly wild and amazing labels for their beers. In fact, one of the founders lived next door to Hunter S. Thompson, which led to Thompson himself even penning odes to their delicious brews. And yes, Flying Dog also liked to curse. They released now well-known beers like Raging Bitch IPA and adorned their beers with the tagline, Good Beer, No Shit. It worked. They're a perennial top 30 craft brewery in America and Flying Dog has built a rabidly loyal and cult-like fan base that has been known to do things like permanently tattoo themselves with the Flying Dog logo in exchange for discounts in the brewery's taproom. While Raging Bitch became a favorite among craft beer enthusiasts, not everyone thought it was funny. In 2009, the Michigan Liquor Control Commission banned Raging Bitch from being sold in Michigan on the grounds that it was detrimental to the health, safety, or welfare of the general public because it allegedly used sexist terminology. Now, it's important to state up front that sexism should never be condoned. For its part, Flying Dog argues that it came up with the name Raging Bitch because the beer uses El Diablo yeast, which is known among brewers as a raging yeast, and that bitch was meant to refer to the original definition of the term, a dog. 
Flying Dog also claimed that it pulled its female employees before releasing the beer, and they were strongly in favor of it. And they also point out that some of Raging Bitch's most virulent fans are, in fact, women. But it's also clear that some breweries in America have adopted names and labels that overtly reference women in ways that could be charitably described as antiquated, or accurately described as backwards, childish, and stupid. But many feel that Flying Dog's names and artistic labels fall well within the bounds of legitimate art rather than rote vulgarity or sexism. Regardless of how one comes out on this debate, and again, there are some legitimately less than tasteful beer labels out there, the question is one of who decides? Should it be consumers? Or private industry groups like the Brewers Association, which has released guidance regarding what it deems as offensive beer labels? Or should it be the government? The problem with having the government do it is twofold. It's really hard line to police, and it also runs squarely into something called the First Amendment. Flying Dog hired attorney Alan Gura to sue Michigan for banning its beer, arguing that it had a First Amendment right to express itself via its labels and artwork and to communicate with its customer base. As Alan recalls, And so the Michigan Liquor Control Commission took the position that to have a beer called Raging Bitch with artwork by Ralph Stedman showing a uh, a dog in a perhaps a angry and they claimed a sexually suggestive pose uh, was detrimental to the health, safety, or welfare of the general public. They uh, um, they were uh, quite quite uh, peeved at the offensive, allegedly nature of of this word and of this product. And Flying Dog's position was: Look, uh, even if the beer is uh, sexist or offensive, and we don't think it is. But even if it were, I mean, Flying Dog has the right to express itself. And the solution to speech you don't like is, is perhaps to avoid it, um, don't buy the beer, or put out a product with, with language that you might prefer. But we don't live in a country where the government can pull products off the shelf because uh, the authorities are offended by the name of the product. Again, the question is who should decide? The First Amendment was designed to protect pretty much every type of speech even if some people don't like that speech. Past court cases have protected everything from swear words to violent video games to pornography under the banner of free speech. And as Michigan itself proved, when the government starts down the road of banning beer labels for the words they contain, it becomes really hard to apply those rules even-handedly. At the same time Michigan was going after Flying Dog over Raging Bitch, it was green-lighting the sale of beers with names like Backwoods Bastard or Big Red Cock, spelled C-O-Q, or, yeah, Arrogant Bastard. And while Michigan was busy banning Flying Dog's beer, every other state in the country allowed Raging Bitch to be sold and didn't seem to find it offensive. Eventually, Michigan seemed to recognize this legal reality and commenced a panicked retreat in the middle of a lawsuit. Michigan defended the the censorship and they defended this rule initially. They really doubled down, they came to court and opposed our request for an injunction. Somewhere along the way, before the judge could could decide the injunction, uh, Michigan had a change of heart. They ran to court and they said, um, you know, we changed our mind, we've read some more First Amendment case law, and we're gonna license the beer, we're gonna forget about this rule, and no harm, no foul, and the case should uh, simply be dismissed. The Flying Dog was not exactly pleased with that because, for one thing, the beer had been banned for a good long time in the state and there were actual damages that Flying Dog suffered and and they wanted to recoup their damages from, from being censored and being unable to sell their product. In the end, Flying Dog recouped monetary damages from the state of Michigan, which they then turned around and used to establish a First Amendment society a nonprofit dedicated to raising awareness for free speech rights and promoting the arts, journalism, and civil liberties. But when it comes to beer labels and the First Amendment, things quickly get even more convoluted than simply banning swear words, as we'll talk about next. If you're interested in the things we're talking about on today's podcast, be sure to check out my new cocktail book, Give Me Liberty and Give Me a Drink, which provides a rollicking, recipe-packed tour of America's most insane and laughable booze laws. Give Me Liberty and Give Me a Drink is available from all major and independent bookstores. 
Also be sure to check out drinksreform.org, our website and weekly newsletter from the R Street Institute, which covers the intersection of alcohol and our legal system. So, okay, we've talked about how governments in states like Michigan try to ban beer labels and names on the grounds that they're allegedly offensive. But governments can also regulate alcohol labels for much more mundane issues as well. And here, the federal government gets to weigh in. The Alcohol and Tobacco Tax and Trade Bureau, known as the TTB and housed within the Treasury Department, actually has to pre-approve every alcohol label that's sold across state lines in America. This process is known as a COLA, which is just a jargony acronym for Certificate of Label Approval. Basically, it just means that if say, an Ohio brewery wants to sell a keg of its beer or a six-pack of cans across the border in Michigan, it not only has to pass muster with Michigan's regulators, but it also needs pre-approval from the TTB for its label and name. As Justin Cox, founder and CEO of Atlas Brew Works in Washington, D.C., notes, the folks at the TTB are notorious sticklers when it comes to labeling rules including rejecting Atlas's very first label application back in 2012. Our logo says Atlas Brew Works, District of Columbia on it. That first label got kicked back saying that the address on the label didn't match our brewer's license, which says Washington, D.C. So I had to change District of Columbia to Washington, D.C. to, to align with that. Yes, a federal agency, itself based in Washington, D.C., didn't seem to appreciate that everyone recognizes the District of Columbia and Washington, D.C. are the same place. Another thing the TTB can be sticklers about is anything, and I mean anything, that can be construed as a health claim on a beer label. One issue that we've run into a few times are the TTB saying that we're making health claims on our labels. So we, we made a beer called Hot Bot for, uh, for an event here in D.C. Um, and it had a, you know, a cartoon robot on it and a little story on the side of the can about this, this robot coming from the future through a couple of universes to come and, and quench your thirst. And we couldn't say that the beer was going to quench your thirst on the label because that was considered to be a health claim by the TTB. And there's a lot more where that came from, as Alan points out. The uh, Treasury Department has rejected a beer label for, for a King of Hearts beer, which had a playing card image on it, because they said that the heart uh, implied that the beer would have a health benefit. They rejected a beer called uh, St. Paula's Liquid Wisdom, uh, which featured a painting called uh, The Conversion of Paula by uh, St. Jerome, because they said that calling a beer Liquid Wisdom was a medical claim that the beer would grant wisdom, and so that, that would be misleading. Um, I'm not kidding. There was a beer called um, Bad Elf that had a sort of a playful elf warning, suggesting that elves not operate toy making machinery while drinking the ale. And that was deemed to be uh, confusing to consumers. And that was not approved. There was another label for a Danish beer that, that featured a hamburger. And they turned that one down because the image implied that there was a meat additive in the beer. I mean, we can go on and on and on. It should be noted that neither Justin nor Alan are necessarily saying that there should be absolutely no regulation of beer labels and names by the government. Both point out the clear government interest in preventing false advertising or obviously untrue statements like, hey, drink this lager, it will actually improve your health. But the problem is when it goes too far, like claiming King of Hearts was somehow trying to suggest a health benefit for your heart. And the other problem is that for alcohol, Unlike almost every other product in America, the government gets to sign off before the product can even go to market. As Justin puts it, It is very rare that you are in an industry where you have to have a pre-approval of a label before you send a product out to market. You know, the cereal box like Kellogg is not submitting their labels to the FDA or the Department of Agriculture, you know, before they, they ship the, the boxes of tricks out to the grocery stores. In other words, if we allow cereal producers, who of course love marketing sugar bomb cereals jammed with questionable sounding ingredients, to send their products to market without getting pre-cleared by the government, then why not alcohol? 
Requiring this before the fact sign-off hurts mostly small brewers who release scores of experimental and seasonal releases, and ones like Atlas Brewworks who like to have clever names and backstories behind their beers. So our, our sort of creative process, we do work with an outside uh, creative agency that helps us with the design and creating the actual art. So we internally, you know, come up with the, the beer name and the style, and um, we kind of come up with a little story, and all of our beers have a, some sort of icon attached to it with, the, with a story that ties it into the beer. Um, so that, we go through that whole process, and now we're in, you know, year seven of dealing with this, so we've gotten, we've gotten better at it. But towards the beginning, a lot of design revisions and anticipation of what the TTB might say, then submitting, and then once the TTB says, oh, you can't say this, or you're missing, you know, the statement on here, we have to go back to the design team, who which we have to compensate them for their time. So every every tweak or uh, or edit that we have to make is, is a definite monetary cost to us. The pre-approval system for alcohol labels hurt Atlas and other producers even more during the 2018-2019 government shutdown. During the shutdown, which lasted over a month, the TTB closed its doors. This meant that distillers, brewers, and winemakers across America literally could not release new beers or spirits if they wanted to sell them across state lines. We had been prepping to brew and had brewed our spring seasonal beer called the Precious One, which is an apricot IPA. So the process of making a new beer, you know, takes four to six months or so from kind of conception to execution. So in the particular case of the Precious One, we had, we had gone through most of that process. We had brewed um, a, a, a lot of beer, had it in our tanks fermenting, ready to, ready to hit the market. Um, we had a cola approval for our can design, but not for our keg collar. So we were able to sell cans um, interstate, but we could only sell the kegs within D.C., the government then shut down, and as part of that shutdown, the TTB offices were closed, so there was no one, no one in the office to review the label, and therefore no one was able to give us the, the approval or issue that COLA, which would then allow us to legally sell that beer across state lines. And that threw a huge wrench in, in our process on a number of fronts. So we had planned um, commitments from retailers. They only have so much shelf space there and so many draft lines in the bar. We had commitments from from bars saying, okay, we will put the, the precious one on, ship us the kegs. Um, we're unable to ship those kegs because we don't have the COLA label approval, and then another brewery comes in and swipes that line. While Atlas luckily did not have any of its beer go to waste, other breweries in the country had to actually start giving away beer for free to prevent it from spoiling. Allen ended up representing Justin and Atlas Brew Works in another First Amendment case against the TTB's pre-approval system during the shutdown, pointing out that the framework was preventing Atlas's beer from getting to market, and therefore preemptively violating Atlas's free speech rights to advertise their products to their customers. The shutdown ended before the court was able to issue a ruling on Atlas's legal argument, and the court dismissed the case, saying it was now moot and irrelevant. But as we all know, Politicians in D.C. love grandstanding, and pretty much everyone expects more, and longer, government shutdowns in our future, which means more headaches for Atlas Brewworks and our other favorite spots. Whether it's the government trying to decide whether words like bastard or offensive or giving breweries like Atlas a hard time about robot-themed brews that, quote, quench your thirst, it's pretty clear that the current system the government uses to regulate beer labels is hurting our nation's entrepreneurial craft spirits producers. Heck, it's enough to make you swear in frustration. And then crack open a beer. I'm Jared Dieterly, and I wrote today's episode of the show. Our show is produced and edited by Greg Benson, host of the Speakeasy and Back Bar, a new podcast coming soon from Heritage Radio Network. The music is written, produced, and recorded by Jessica Lee Graves. And the cover art for the show was created by Ann Phelan. I'd also like to thank Bill Gray and the R Street Institute, as well as today's guests, Alan Gura and Justin Cox of Atlas Brewworks. And if you enjoyed today's show, check out my new book, Give Me Liberty and Give Me a Drink, as well as drinksreform.org. Our next episode will feature a metaphorical road trip to Virginia and Massachusetts to talk about the war on happy hour. 
So be sure to join us in two weeks for more about drinking and everything that gets in the way. Make me a Negroni, margarita old-fashioned. Let's pop the champagne. We've got a right to drink.